Many egg companies want you to think that their hens are roaming free and happy. But a lot of those cage-free hens are actually trapped inside a warehouse, like recess got canceled forever. That's why Vital Farms works with family-run farms so hens can do hen things outside all year long. Every Vital Farms egg comes from a pasture-raised hen who enjoys a minimum of 108 square feet of roaming room while enjoying fresh air and sunshine. We bet you can taste the difference. Vital Farms, where honest food is raised. Hi there. Welcome back to The Future of X, a podcast from Ozzy in partnership with Vital Farms. I'm your host, Isabel Lee. In this episode, we are looking at the world of ethical eating. It sounds complicated, but really, it's pretty simple. We are looking at the impact that your food choices will have on the food systems of tomorrow. I spent last summer on a Sonoma ranch with neighbors who supplied me with endless fresh produce and even farm fresh eggs in exchange for a hard day's work. I also took care of baby cows, which ultimately resulted in the decision to become a vegetarian. I still love eating eggs and other dairy products, but I just can't face the idea of eating meat. I may change my mind, but for now I feel good about my food choices. Many of us make dietary decisions like this to feed our souls, whether we buy from grocery stores, urban farms, or local markets. That is true for meat eaters, vegans, pescatarians, and vegetarians like me. There are many choices today, but how will our buying options and food ethics look in 30 years? For me, buying seasonally is important, and I think it makes them that much more special when things aren't available all year round. Our values play into decisions on what we buy and on what we eat. What we decide to put into our bodies does have ethical salience and in this kind of everyday way. And obviously, like supporting local and organic is really important to me, too. But can the choices we make today change how we approach food in the future? Animal rights activism heated up in the 1960s, and it remains a hot topic when it comes to food ethics. But questions about how livestock are treated and slaughtered have been around since the beginning of time. So do we ever have the right to take an animal's life? I actually cringe every time I hear someone say, so what's the protein choice for today? You mean, what animal are we going to kill and eat today? That's Niaz Dori, executive director of the National Family Farm Coalition. Our food system has led us down this really ugly, dark alley where we don't care if the pigs are terrified entering a slaughterhouse and treated in such ways when they're alive that we wouldn't want any living being to be treated. Niaz is far from alone. Scholars like Andrew Chignall tackle the issue in the classroom. He's a professor of philosophy and religion at Princeton and editor of the book Philosophy Comes to Dinner, Arguments About the Ethics of Eating. Andrew identifies as a flexible vegan. It was the ethical treatment of animals that led him to believe he could be happy eating meat on occasion. I tend to be mostly vegan or plant forward, as I said, but I've even encountered farms up in, you know, in New Jersey where the animals are treated better than I have ever seen. You know, the bulls do have the summer of love followed by one very bad day at the slaughterhouse. But, you know, we all have one, at least one very bad day facing us at the end of our lives. So why can't we all eat animals that are treated humanely? Simply put, it is expensive. Happy cows and pigs cost more than factory farm meat. Not everyone can afford to consider ethics when it comes to filling their shopping carts or their plates. This has ethical implications. If we are having some limitations based on where we live, our zip code, the color of our skin, our income level, our class, Right there, we're hitting at the heart of what is unethical about our current food system. Meat is just one example. Shoppers already pay higher costs for organic, local, and fair trade options for all kinds of food products. Unless we change our food system, this will only get worse. 
that's our task to make sure that ethical eating isn't just something that's available to those of us that have uh, the means and access, but it's something that is uh, extended to all those who have to eat, which is pretty much every human on this planet. That planet is getting more crowded. By 2050, there will be 2 billion more mouths to feed. That planet is also getting richer, and this greater prosperity results in more demand for meat, eggs, and milk. To feed more livestock, farmers grow monoculture crops, or single crops in a given field. But this robs the soil of nutrients and makes it harder to grow healthy food. This puts humanity on a perilous path. In our first episode, we looked at how arable land is harder to find thanks to carbon depletion, and how we can help fix that with practices to heal the soil. But the way we cultivate livestock is also part of the problem. So how should we think about ethical meat eating? Andrew Chignall again. If we use animals, they should be humanely treated and killed in a cruelty-free way. Vegan or vegetarian lifestyles will also be easier to maintain with a wider variety of alternatives by 2050. And that even many of our meats are going to be made out of plants in another couple of decades. Plant-based options for replacing meat do seem promising, but keep in mind that many rely on soy oil, which is not sustainably grown. Niaz Dori. If we really do care about ecosystems and the entire life cycle of those animals, chopping down the entire forest systems of the Amazon or burning it down to raise more soy, to me, doesn't solve the problem. So what we really need are meat alternatives that come from a different source, a sustainable source, no matter how imaginative or back to the future-esque it might seem. Andrew Chignall. Well, I imagine we sit down and we have some cultivated meat, which was grown in a lab and maybe is real animal protein, but was never associated with sentience or suffering or all of the kind of dirt and mess that comes out of animal farms and slaughterhouses and so forth. And then also some vegetables that were grown, let's say, in a vertical agriculture situation Yes, we are talking about hamburgers and steaks served up by modern science. This could be a viable solution for the plates of the future, as long as the lab-grown meat is produced with energy from renewable sources. Now, what about the rest of our diet? The carbs, the vegetables, nuts, fruits. Buying organic food locally and seasonally is widely considered better for the environment. Abir Najjar, food writer and Palestinian-American chef of the Huda Supper Club in Oakland, California, is a stickler for seasonal eating. I think if we lean more into knowing what products are seasonal, what products are within our own regions, wherever we live, becoming more connected to local farms and supporting them, I think that's just one way to make a small change in people's lives. Niaz Dori agrees. Ethical eating is about being in tune with the cycles of nature, being in tune with where the food came from, what went into providing us with that food. But these options are, again, more expensive. Not everyone can afford to buy organic fruits and vegetables. Backyard or patio gardens can help, and growing food at home has long been an essential and supplemental practice. But even when we buy local, organic, and in-season, we still have to consider how our food is grown. Andrew Chignall. What are the conditions under which these people are working? How is the land being treated? What's the relationship between worker and land? Using more land for food, as we learned in episode one, can be bad for the much-needed carbon buildup required for healthy soil. We must also dig into the working conditions on these farms. Abir Najjar. I also think about labor practices. And I, I think about ingredients like coffee or chocolate or produce or quinoa or avocados. And if those things are being sourced using unfair labor practices or harming the earth or exploiting small food producers, it doesn't sit well with me. And no, we can't outsource the ethical burden by eating at restaurants. We must understand the impact of our choices throughout the entire farm-to-table cycle, including who is serving us at the table. 
Preeti Mystery is a chef who owned the now shuttered Juhu Beach Club in Oakland, California. More and more people are becoming mindful of the ways restaurant workers are treated. This has always been going on, but the momentum that it's gained because of the pandemic and the way it sort of pulled the curtain back for on a lot of um, bad actors, I think has made a difference. Even home cooks following foodie trends in magazines and cooking shows need to be mindful. Abir Najjar explains. Sometimes when one product becomes really popular and the market shifts, it sometimes opens up the gateways for people to be exploited um, or land or indigenous people to be exploited because of this product suddenly becoming so valuable. A good example is quinoa. Everybody was like, this is so good, it's so healthy. And it became so popular and the value drove so high that indigenous people in Peru who used to eat this grain all the time couldn't afford it anymore. The people sourcing it couldn't even eat it. The humble Haas avocado is another victim. Its popularity in wealthy countries has affected trade flows. The stress it started putting on avocado farmers, specifically in Mexico, was to only grow this type and to grow them as fast as possible and try to use practices that might be harmful to the earth or might be harmful to their farms just so they can crank out all these avocados for us to have on avocado toast. This kind of global pressure applies to any popular food trend, even those plant-based bean alternatives we mentioned earlier. And it's going to be in every food magazine and every food blogger is going to be talking about it. And it's going to create this pressure on the market that might ultimately hurt people or exploit people. Niaz agrees. The ethic of eating is a global issue. It has global implications when we demand strawberries 12 months out of the year. A lot goes into an honest day's work at Vital Farms. Their purpose is to bring ethically produced food to the table. And they believe that pasture-raising animals is the most humane and sustainable way to achieve that. That's why Vital Farms partners with nearly 200 family farms, helping them to rotate their pastures and do right by the land. Because helping the land helps the hens, which helps the eggs, which helps you. Vital Farms, where honest food is raised. So far, this episode has centered on American food systems and, in large part, meat production. But the world is full of different ways of eating and different ethical systems to guide those choices. Andrew Chignall. A vast majority of humanity still guides their ethical thinking by a kind of religious tradition. So, you know, you have to think about what family religious culture has been. And that's important for philosophers to consider. Culture plays a vital role in Abir's decisions in the kitchen. For example, as she prepares Palestine-inspired dishes. When it comes to Arab or Swana. Swana stands for Southwest Asian, North African. When it comes to Arab or Swana-based food products, I want them to be products that have integrity and I want to be supporting the people and companies that are sourcing those products. She ensures they are shipped from Palestine in a sustainable way. Meaning, we can continue to enjoy the foods we consume without destroying our food resources for future generations. Professor Andrew Chignall teaches a popular online course, The Ethics of Eating, in which he's starting to better account for the impact of culture. One of the things we're adding to the course this time around is a long series, a series of lectures on non-Western traditions, especially Indian and Chinese. Preeti Mystery warns Western eaters to steer clear of copying traditions in exploitative ways. There's been so much sort of Eurocentric white supremacy about what good food is or what great food is. And over the years, the decades, people are like, let's try, you know, this Indian food, this Thai food, this Mexican food. Wow, it's amazing. So what is the downside of global and cultural appreciation of food and foodie trends? If everyone wants something, it drives up prices. Farmers then produce the high demand foods in ways that are not sustainable. Does it mean you have to give up your favorite foods? No, but you probably need to come to grips with not having strawberry and rhubarb pie all year round. 
The battle for the future of farming needs your help. If you have the education, the background, the ability, and maybe the resources to find out a bit more about your food and support the kinds of projects and entities that are more ethically impressive, then maybe you should. Your food choices today will not change the entire food system overnight. They are just one small step towards a more ethical eating system in the future. There's less of an emphasis on the consequences of this choice right now and more on kind of exercising the muscles of these different virtues and trying to think in a context relative way about what sort of person that will turn you into. If eating according to your values is not enough for you, you can also help change the food system from the outside. Maybe if we're real consequentialists, what we should do is the petitions and the policies and the activism. After all, it very well may be your tax dollars propping up the food systems we currently have. So what do we see for the future of food ethics in 2050? Looking forward 5, 10, 20 years down the line, I'm reaching back to the wisdom of the past. There was a time that we ate in concert with nature, that, that we honored the cycles of nature, the, the seasonal nature of our food system and the ecosystems that feed us. I hope moving forward, that plays a bigger role, that we're okay with the fact that right now, rhubarb is really <laughs> popping all over the place here, that we're okay that we're eating seafood that we may not have known about before, and we're okay with those choices that are being made for us by nature. Andrew hopes that by 2050, we have a food system that gives back more and extracts less. Something that's less exploitative of the land and of people and of animals, and that has a reduction in terms of emissions, health implications, animal cruelty, and sort of in general environmental degradation. Abir Najjar hopes that consumer outrage leads to greater accountability. That we won't be seeing corporations being absolved of all their responsibility when it comes to exploiting uh, people for labor. I hope we're in a place that it's so enraging to people that it's not something we just let go on. And Niaz, in her role at the National Family Farm Coalition, is fighting for justice. I hope that that plate represents economic justice across our food system. I hope it represents farmers and fishermen and ranchers who are actually themselves able to eat the same plate of food we're eating. How might more justice play out at the farm level? Preeti Mystery. There's going to be more of a push, I think, within BIPOC communities. BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. To gain more access to land and a sort of for us, by us mentality instead of continuing to work within these broken white systems that just perpetuate patriarchy and white supremacy. <laughs> The next 30 years will see even more pressure applied to an already stressed food system, with growing populations, greater urbanization, and more access to wealth, plus climate change and strained natural resources. The hope is that we can impact the food systems of tomorrow by planting the seeds of smarter choices today. Beyond our shopping carts, we can support activism in this space to fundamentally change our food systems from the top down. Are you wondering how technology will help improve farming and food systems in the years to come? In our next episode, we will dive into big data, blockchain, and how they will impact your choice of beets. Yes, beets. From farm level data, hundreds of sensors passively collect data on soil, right, on moisture, on chemical. To supply chain tracking. It's really a combination of cloud infrastructure as well as digital technologies that enable us to be able to pinpoint where the grain has come from. To climate data and genomics. The climate change data means that we are aggregating this rainfall, temperature, and sometimes solar radiation. This type of data we are getting from the satellite data. We will look at whether data can help farmers improve yields and profitability. And as for your food choices in the future, 
We'll discover how your smartphone will help steer you in good directions. Thanks for joining us on the Future of X, Future of Farming. This series is a partnership between Aussie Media and Vital Farms. It's written and hosted by me, Isabel Lee, writer at Aussie. It was produced by Cecily Meza-Martinez and Joshua Sui. Kate Piggott co-wrote the episode and also produced. Special thanks to Tracy Moran, Sean Braswell, and Simran Sethi. Chris Hoff engineered our show. Make sure to subscribe to The Future of X, Future of Farming on the iHeartRadio app or listen wherever you get your podcasts.